Right, hello and welcome to lecture one. And today we are really getting started with R and R Studio. But I want to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing here and why we're doing this. So the general idea is that as scientists, we want to try and answer questions about nature, for example. And what we do to answer these questions is we generate data, we collect data, like we count things and we make countable what is not countable. And then at some point we have to analyze this data. This also, the purpose of, of, of answering the question, is my hypothesis correct, for example? Or could this just be a fluke? And then in the end, we want to show our results to our colleagues and we do this by, for example, generating plots, generating statistics and showing these numbers and figures. And this is what we will learn here. We will generate beautiful plots but these plots and statistics also need to be correct, not only beautiful. Um, then there's also another question, um, why am I doing another recording? Because um, I did this whole course last year as well. Um, the truth is uh, there's two answers to this question. One is after I did the whole recording, I decided I had so much fun doing it, I wanted to do more of this. So I got a fancy new microphone and I sort of want to do this whole thing with better sound quality. And then there's another reason for it, and that is more of a pedagogical one. Um, a lot of the things I explained, sometimes I think the order can be improved, so they are less confusing. So I will teach mostly the same things. I will leave some things out and put them in later part so that they don't confuse you while you're learning other things. And I also want to make sure the exercises are more focused on the lectures themselves. So you have to do less picking and choosing what part of the lecture that you learned, now you actually need the exercises. So without further ado, let's get started. So here I am on my desktop and you should see me in the corner here and you should see my desktop. And I will just open up RStudio by clicking on my little R button here. You will search it in the operating system. And this is what we are created with. So this is the R console, as it says up here, if I type what R calls an expression. An expression is just us telling R to do something. For example, one plus one, R does it, and R tells us the answer is two. In that regard, it is a lot like talking to a digital assistant like Google or Cortana or Siri, I think it's the Apple one. So you're asking R to do things and R gives you answers. And sometimes R doesn't understand you and it tells you that it didn't understand you. And we'll talk about this as well. Now, we could just write everything right here in the console, but then later on, we wouldn't know what we did. Say we analyze the big data set and we generate some plots. And then in the end, um, someone asks, hey, how did you generate this plot? So we'd have no, have no idea. We'd have to redo all these steps manually. And we don't want to do that. And this is why we will generate first here an R script. In the top left corner, we click on the new file button. And now we have this untitled file. Well, it's untitled because we haven't saved it yet. And if I type in here, say I want to calculate one plus one, I can press control enter, and this will send this line down here and execute it. Um, say I want to execute multiple lines, I can highlight those and execute all of them. And so both of these were ex executed. They had nothing to do with, with each other, but they ran after each other. So in a way, a script that we are writing, and I can save it on my operating system here, um, but I won't do that right now. A script that, that we're writing is like a recipe. So you're, you're baking a cake, for example, you write down the recipe. And then the most important part about this is this recipe. If you have your raw ingredients, which will eventually be your raw data that you collected through some biochemical measurement, for example, or you counted penguins. Um, this is your raw, da raw data. It's like your raw ingredients for a cake. If you have the recipe, you can always recreate whatever plots or statistics you have. So the recipe will be the most important thing. Don't care too much about the output. If you lose the output, it's fine. If you lose a plot, you can always regenerate it if you have the recipe. So what you will learn here is writing good recipes in a way. And parts of writing good recipes 
is organizing your work and not doing everything in all over the place. And for this, we will use RStudio projects. Right now in the top left, left corner, it says project none because we are not in a project. So what we want to do is create a new project. All right, in a new directory, because I'm assuming you don't have one yet. And then we choose new project. Um, I'm just doing it in a, on the desktop because I actually already have a project for this whole course. Um, but just for demonstration, I want to create a new project for lecture one. Um, for example, let's just call lecture one and I do it on my desktop. And now our studio will switch projects. And in the top right corner, we can see we are in this project now. And in the files panel, so our studio is organized in these panels. In the files panel, which is here, it might also be on the top right corner in your layout. Um, we can see we only have this one file, lecture1.r project. We can also open it up in what on Windows would be Explorer or Finder in macOS, I think. Um, and on in our desktop, I have this folder, lecture1, and it's just one file, lecture1.r project. If I double click this, our studio will automatically open this project. Um, but also in our studio, we have this list of projects so we can easily switch between things. And in this project, Let's now generate an R script and save it and call it lecture one demo, for example. I advise you not to use spaces in your file names. Um, if you have to use a space, you'd rather use an underscore, for example. And the extension is .r. And I can't type. That's there's an E missing, but it doesn't matter for now. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about this whole layout thing, because um, right now we have this R script here. We have the console down here. Um, but I usually like to arrange it, arrange it a little bit different, different, and I don't want you to be confused by future videos. So let's do this right now. Um, underneath view, we can check panes. So this is how all the panels are arranged. I mean, down here we find pane layout. And what I usually do is I have this source column, which is where our source code, our scripts, our recipes live. Um, and I have this console uh, to the right of it because I like to have more, um, more space for my script. Right now I have this whole script here and you can think of it as we are sending a command from the left into the console to the right. In your case, it would be down in the bottom. Um, yes, that's how I like to arrange things. And then there's a couple of settings underneath tools and global options that I would like you to change as well. And one is to uncheck this box and make sure it says it doesn't restore the R data into workspace at startup. And well, I also have set this box here. So this setting, I think it's quite important. The reason for this is um, actually, it will become apparent when we talk about variables in a second. <clears throat> so uh, another thing I forgot in global options, I usually like to work with a darker theme. So I use this one <clears throat> because I think it's nice on the eyes. However, this theme is not included in our studio by default, but I will make a little bonus section in the end where I can show where I show you how to install this theme if you want it as well. All right, now it looks like my R Studio normally looks like, um, so I'm more comfortable, and you also know how I got there. <coughs> All right, let's talk about a, a couple of things about what we can do with R. So I already showed you we can add add numbers, but that's not particularly interesting. Um, all the normal math things just work. So we can add things, divide things, we can multiply things. Um, there's another operator which is quite interesting, which is the colon operator. So if I type 1 colon 10, for example, it will generate all the numbers from 1 to 10. And if I type, for example, 3 to 5 or 3 to 4, um, we get numbers from 3 to 4, so it's just 3 and 4. 
The interesting part about this is now when we do mathematical operations with these things that are called vectors, so these are vectors, um, it happens in a vectorized manner. And that means, say I have the numbers from 1 to 3 and I add uh, another, like again, the numbers from 1 to 3. What happens is we add the first one to the first one, we add the second number, which is 2, to the second two, which is four, and the three sides are together. So it happens um, basically in parallel. Not in terms of computing, but um, those things happen next to each other. Um, actually, in R, everything is a vector. So even if our table has just say like 20, um, it still says this one, and this means the first entry of this vector is 20. Um, same here, if I generate a longer vector, we will get more, say 1 to 100, we'll get more of these, so the first entry is 1, it just adds these little indices so we know roughly, roughly where we are at. So the 90 uh, first entry is 91, and then the 100th entry, entry is 100. So if I have only one entry, it's it is not treated any differently than anything that has like more values. There's no scalars, for example. You would call those like single single values. Everything is just a vector, and single uh, values are just vectors of length one. And this thing I added here, this hashtag thing, is a comment. And what comments do is nothing. You can put anything behind this hashtag, and R will execute. Execute this code, and it will just not do anything. You can do you do use this to annotate your recipe. So now, what happens if we want to reuse something for later? And this is what we need variables for. In order to create a variable, we first need a name. Um, let's, for example, create one and call it one, and then. I press Alt and minus, and Alt and minus will enter this sign in our studio, which is less than and minus. You can also just type less than and minus, but Alt minus is sometimes faster to type. And then we can give it a value. If I execute this, now I can use one wherever I would use the normal one, for example. So this is called an assignment. We are assigning one to well, the variable called one. So vari variables are like boxes where you can put things in and then you can reuse them. They are mutable by default. So if I later do something else, um, for example, now I put two in this box, now two is in the box, so one plus one, which is the variable one, will be three. So if I assign this once, it doesn't mean it will stay one forever. We can change it later on. The important thing is here that the order of execution matters. While we're playing around with this recipe, we can do things in whatever order we want, right? I can go up here and execute this line. I can now execute this line. I could also uh, put this line down here. So if I run this in order, I would say one is now one. I add this variable to one and the result would be two. I now set one to two. If I execute this line again, it is now three. So this line doesn't know where it's at in the script. However, if we run this whole script, say we, we could highlight this whole thing and run it, this would run everything, or we go up here into source and this runs the whole thing. It runs the whole script from top to bottom. This is when the order of execution, execution matters. And you know from baking a cake that it is important to have the correct order in your recipe, right? You can't just assume that the person reading your recipe knows what order things should be put in or should be executed in. You usually put things in order. And this is the same when writing scripts. Let's talk a um, Let's talk a little bit about what names for variables are allowed. Uh, for example, I can't have spaces. Um, 
this will not work. There's a space in here. So what we do, do we do when we want something that is that consists of more than one word, for example, we would put an underscore here. So this, for example, this works. This underscore variable, and this is quite common. Um, let's put 42 in here. Now putting underscores works quite well. There's other conventions which are not using in this course, um, but sometimes people in other programming languages, for example, and sometimes in R as well, they use this thing called camel case, where they just capitalize the letters in between. Uh, note now that this will now be a different variable, and those are not the same, but those are allowed names. So capitalization matters in variable names. So there's different ways to name your variables, but this is quite recommended. All right, uh, let's talk about different data types we can have in R. So right now we only used numbers. In R, those are called numeric. So one, two, three, whatever. Um, also one point something like floating point, floating point numbers or real numbers. They are also numeric and we can use those. If we want to explicitly tell R that the number is a whole number, what R calls integers, uh, we have this uppercase L that we put behind it and it will work just like the other numbers. But I will now know these are whole numbers, so we can't, can't have floating points. Sometimes this can be faster because it doesn't need to care about decimal points. So you can optimize computations. But usually you just type one and you're fine. Another common type of data that you will see is um, text. So text is denoted by starting with these Quotation, quotation marks. You can use double quotation marks. You can also use single quotation marks, uh, but usually people use these double quotation marks. And text uh, in R is also called a character. Um, by the way, uh, you don't have to, like I recommend to follow along with this tutorial and try stuff out. Um, but if you feel like you're falling behind or something, you can also pause the video but you can also have a look in the script later on, which will be online. So everything that I'm typing here, I will put up on the website um, and you can read up on some explanations. I think it's great to watch the video to just get, um, get a, a lecture, right? Um, and follow along. But then later on, if you want to re-look up stuff, it's easier, I guess, if you have a script and this is why I'm making the script available. And there are also, um, I didn't talk about it yet, but there are also complex numbers in R. So one plus like two I, for example, it's just a complex number. And R can also calculate with those. Uh, it, it just does complex um, mathematics, which usually you don't need. But in case you do, R does have complex numbers. So maybe you're doing some uh, physics homework with R. Um, and they can come in handy there. Another type of data which we will encounter is in R called logical. In other languages or programming languages, they call it Boolean values. And this is just true or false or yes or no. And this is what R gives us when we ask it a question. For example, we can ask, is two smaller than five? Uh, five. And the answer is true. Or is two equal to Five. And for equal, for asking if something is equal, we use the double equal sign. And this is false. So the answer will be here. Or is it not equal? For this, we'll use the not operator, which is an exclamation mark, not equal. And of course, there's also greater than um, or greater than or equal, for example, or less than or equal. So these things exist. And these give you logical values and we can store the answers in a variable as well. For example, let's call it answer. And now if we later on need this, we can use this. 
Uh, you can see sometimes there's a little win window popping up when I'm typing, which is really handy. And this is the auto completion of our studio. Um, so I just type ANS, for example, and it tells me, um, for example, there's a data set in here, but my variable answer is also in here. If this doesn't pop up, you can also trigger it to show the auto completion using control and spacebar. Or um, the tab key also opens, uh, automatically chooses the first auto completion. So control spacebar to open the auto completion. Now the variables we have created so far, they show up in this environment panel. And let me just give a, get a sip of coffee. So this is all the variables we have created so far. And this is where the setting I showed you earlier comes in. I said, um, do not have this checked. Don't restore the R data into workspace at exit. Because what this would do is, um, if I now exit our studio, it would save these variables from our global environment and then make them available the next time we open up our studio. Which sounds like a good idea at first, until you realize um, this might make you dependent on, for example, um, this G or this one or this variable being available here, right? I can still use this. However, this variable was not created in the recipe I'm writing right now because I deleted the code. I'm not, I'm, I'm no longer using it. But now if I write some other steps in the recipe, which rely on this variable, it would still work for some time on my machine until I lose this global environment or until someone else tries this who doesn't have this global environment and then it wouldn't work. So we want our recipes to be self-contained to only need some raw ingredients like our raw data and not something dependent on say something we did like a week ago. It's not like one of those cook shows where you can say that we already prepared something um, and you don't give the recipe for it. You always need to write a recipe because we want this to be able to run on other people's computers as well. All right, let's talk a little bit about, oh, there's two more, there's two more things I want to show you. And this is NA. NA is also a special type of value and NA stands for not assigned. So if R doesn't know what the value is, you will get an NA. And this NA is contagious. So if we do anything, say any mathematical operation with NA, uh, it will also be NA. So NA plus 10, for example, it's just NA. Because if we don't know the value of <coughs> something we're adding to 10, we also don't know the value of whatever the result is. And there's another value called null, which also stands for like no value. There's, there's nothing here. I don't even know if you can calculate with null. I think it, okay, it's, it does something super weird. Um, it returns a numeric vector of length of zero. So there's nothing there. It's just, it turns everything into nothing. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up, we didn't do any, anything else than adding things and saving things in variable. So let's introduce some functions. And functions, in some cases, are just like mathematical functions. For example, the sine function, we can calculate the sine of 10 or the cosine of, I think pi is also a variable that is already included in R by default. So we can calculate the cosine of pi. Yeah, pi is already in here. That's quite nice. So these are just mathematical functions. And what functions in the general context do is they take some arguments. If I press control enter, it explicitly tells us it, it wants an argument X. And so they take an argument X and then they return something. And we can, we can take this return value and save it in a variable. Let's call it codes of X. And now we can use it later. Uh, and this would actually, I guess, this would be the cosine of 10, would be a better name for it. And now we can use it for later. 
Now, anytime you encounter a new function, well, I guess cosine and sine aren't very fancy, but um, we can always control and click on it. And this shows us where it's defined, but this doesn't help us here. What we want to do is um, press F1 while hovering over it. So F1 is the key we want to press. And this will open up the help viewer in here. And this is really helpful. So we usually get a description of what the function does. It tells us how to use it. And then the important part also is this arguments thing. So X and Y. Um, there's Y only for, for the R time 2, which I have never used before. But all the others only take an X. So we put in a number internally in this function that will be called X, but doesn't matter. And there's two ways of giving arguments to a function. The first one is here, for example, I didn't specify x. x equals 10. I just said sine of 10. And this is because there's two ways to give arguments to a function. And the first one is by those argument names. And the second one is just by the order these arguments appear in. So if it were to take multiple arguments, we could give it multiple arguments. Um, and those would be just be passed in order, in the order you see in the help page. So let's look at a couple more functions. Um, the C function, for example, C just stands for combine. And this is um, quite a simple but helpful function. And you can combine values into a vector or a list, but we're not talking about lists right now. Um, well, I should mention vectors. We have seen before, for example, 1 to 10. And everything in R that is just values of the same type. These are just all numbers, or if it's all text, it's all. These are called atomic vectors because, um, well, they are not divisible anymore. Um, they are not containers of more containers, for example. They're not containing more things. They're just these values. And with C, we can combine values into vectors. So 1, for example, and I want the 3 as well, and I want the 5. And this will give me the vector 1, 3, 5. So this is already more helpful than just getting numbers in order. Um, I'm not doing anything else with it for now. but for And then, of course, we can also store this in a variable. Um, For later use. You can also, if you don't want to, if you just want to look at the value of something, you can just highlight this thing and press Control Enter and it will just execute the highlighted part. If nothing is highlighted, it will execute the whole line. And you can also always see it in your environment panel. Here, for example, some numbers is numeric, so it contains numbers, and this is the value. Uh, speaking of numeric, um, what if we have some number, but it's written in a text thing? So now R will, will think this is text, right? Because we, we told it it's text. Oh, and now I executed like half half of a, of a statement, and R thinks there's something else coming. So I need to tell it just some, I don't know, garbled thing so it's, it knows to stop. <laughs> so this is now text. So we can't use this to calculate anything. If I try to add, for example, one to it, it will say, non-numeric argument to binary operator, but plus in our case is a binary operator because it takes two arguments, one from the left side, one from the right side. And non-numeric means, well, there's some text here, which we also call some text, but R doesn't know that. So what we would want to do is tell R, now this text, we want to convert it into a number. And for this, we have the function s dot, and then there's a bunch of options, and the one we want is s numeric. So we can take some text and convert it into numbers. And now these are actual numbers. 
Um, keep in mind, this did not change our original variable sum text. What we just did is, so as numeric is a function that takes an argument, some text, and it returns this variable as a numeric. So if we want to actually now use this, um, we could give it a new name or we could override, override another variable. Um, so if I give it a new name, I can now use this name and do some calculations with it, for example. Right, easy enough. But um, I can also take um, a variable and override it. So like I said, variables are, are mutable. So right now some text is this text thing and this doesn't work. If I now override this and take this line and run it again, now it will work. So we changed the content of some text. All right, let's look at a couple of more functions um, that work with numbers. For example, the maximum, um, we need some numbers first, right? Let's call it numbers and just generate some numbers. I'm just randomly meshing on the keyboard, I think. Okay, what's the maximum of those numbers? It's 441 something, or the minimum. So these functions can give us these answers. We can also get both of these answers with the one function using the range. <clears throat> function which will return a vector where the first element is zero and the so the minimum and the second element is the maximum <clears throat> now all these functions also have more arguments <clears throat> so firstly they take this dot 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 which means any number of arguments so we can also put um, more numbers in here i don't have more numbers right now i can put in the same numbers again but this wouldn't change anything because uh, the range is still the same. <clears throat> now they also have this argument na.rm and this is quite cryptic but it says um, indicating if na should be omitted. So say we have some values in here which are not assigned. It still works. But all those functions will now return na and this means well, the maximum of a bunch of numbers where we don't know one of the numbers, we don't know the answer. We can still get an answer by telling R2, okay, it's fine to remove those NA values. So NA.RM takes a logical value, and this is one of those true or false ones. So we type true here. And this means, okay, R, it's fine to remove those not assigned values. And now we get an answer. So we could do those for all those functions. And now it works for those functions as well. Um, speaking of a bunch of numbers, sometimes you want to quickly create not say the numbers from 1 to 100, but you want to create a sequence of numbers with some other property. Then there's the sec function, for example, which takes an argument from and to, which are the starting and ending points. So from 10, for example, to 20. And this will just be numbers from 10 to 20. But we have more arguments, like by, for example, the number to increment the, increment the sequence by. So we can just get numbers divisible by seven, for example. Or we can say, we don't specify two, but instead we specify 
length.out. And this will mean we are starting from 10 and then we are keeping going until we have 10 numbers. All right, that's all well and good. We learned about some very basic functions, but the power actually only starts when we start creating our own functions. And we do this using the function keyword in R. <coughs> so a function keyword, and now we need to tell it what we want its arguments to be called. Um, well, X is quite common for something that works with numbers. So let's call it X. And now we start with a curly braces. And usually people put this now in a new line. So let's make a very simple function that just takes this x and it adds one to it. So what a function does is it takes arguments and returns something. So in here we need this return keyword, return, and we return x plus one, for example. Now we have this function, but we can't really use it because we didn't give it a name. And we're giving it a name the same way we are creating variables. So let's call it add one. And now add one, if I execute this code, is a function that takes any x and adds one to it. We can execute it and sure enough, 10 plus one is 11. Same for the numbers from one to 10, we're adding one to each of those. Let's make a bit more complicated function. Um, let's say we have a function that takes some numbers and standardizes it. So so it takes some numbers x. And what we want to do is get the maximum of x, which is just going to be max x. And then what we want to do is um, is take all those values of x and divide them by their maximum. And now it's in some way standardized so that the maximum is always one. Of course, we want to return this. If I now execute this, I can have my function here. I can standardize the numbers from one to 10, for example. And now they're standardized so that the maximum is always one. Another trick, uh, you often don't see this return here because by default, R just in, in functions returns to wh whoever called the function, the last thing that happened in the function. So this in here is called the function body and the last thing in a function body is just return. So we can omit the return if it's just this simple. And now it still works. <clears throat> in this case, you might argue, um, we don't even need to create this variable max x in here. We could just uh, uh, put max of x just in here. And this would also work. The reason I created a variable for this is I wanted to show you that this variable here, it only exists inside of this function. So outside max of x is not defined, right? It says object not found. Um, by the way, in R, basically everything is called an object. So everything that exists is an object and everything that does something is a function. So this variable, this max x, is just not existent outside of this function. In software uh, programming, people call this the scope. So max x is only in the scope of this function, um, which is quite nice. It also means that if I have some variable, um, and this is say 42, and I use the same name inside of the function again, right? Uh, and now it says some variables defined but not used, which makes sense because um, I changed it here. So now I'm not calling it max x anymore, I'm calling it some variable. Um, but I have already defined a sum variable outside of here. And now the standardized function still, still works. But we might wonder, wonder now, what is the value of some variable? 
You can take a moment to, to guess, because outside here we say some variables 42, and in the function we say, well, it's the maximum of x, and then we executed it with the uh, numbers from 1 to 10, so the maximum would be 10. Is it now 42 or 10? And the answer is 42. And this is because this assignment only happened in the scope of this function, so it doesn't change anything in the outside world, basically. Which is nice, because it means um, we can be more sure about what things are when functions don't randomly change things around them. They only operated on what they are giving. Um, a slight note on what this is called. Um, a function which just takes some arguments and then returns something and it doesn't have any side effects. So it doesn't change anything else. It doesn't say print something to your console. It doesn't um, change the state of your computer by saving a file, for example, or it doesn't rely on the state of your computer. It just takes some arguments and returns something. This is called a pure function. And pure functions are nice because they work just like mathematical functions. And you can be very sure about that if you understand the pure function in itself, um, you don't have to worry about much else. So this makes your code nicer to reason about and nicer to reuse. You can use this function anywhere and it would just work. All right. So this is one of the powers of creating our own functions, but the true power comes from working as a team and working together. Because not only can we create our own functions, other people can of course also create their own functions and then share those functions. And the sharing part in R happens through something called a package. So a package is basically just a bunch of functions and you can load those. And if you load the package, you have all those functions that someone else defined. So we are installing package, packages through something, uh, through a function called install packages. You can just type install packages and then as a text, so we need you use quotes, we give it the name of the function we want to install. And there's a couple of functions I want you to, to install because we will be using them a bunch. The first one is called R markdown. So we run this code. And well, there's R is doing some work. It's downloading the package and installing it. And now it's, it's there. And if you have a package, you can use the function library to load it. For example, library R markdown. If I execute this line now, I have all the functions in the R markdown package available and can just use them. Um, a markdown in itself is not a package from which we will use the functions. We will use it for something else. Um, but while we're at it, let's install some other packages as well. Because the main pa main package we will be using is called the tidyverse. And the tidyverse is special because the tidyverse is actually not just one package, it is a collection of packages. But we can load this whole thing with just library tidyverse. And then we will have all those packages and functions available if we have them installed. So those are the two packages um, you will need for today. Actually, there's another package I forgot about um, we will need for today. So this will just um, execute and it takes a while. And the I can already tell you the other package. Let's type the code in here already. Install.packages. And the other package is called Palmer Penguins. And this does not this does another thing that packages can do, and this is uh, providing data sets. So we have some data sets we can play around with, we can experiment with. So we don't have to go out and collect our own data. Um, so once this is done, we can install this other package. There's a reason that I wrote this install packages in the console and not in our recipe down here in, in our script. And the reason for this is if I have this in the script, 
and I, I give this, um, I can execute this now. If I give this script then to someone else, um, they will of course see these library things and know, okay, these are the packages I need so they can install those. Um, but if I have this install packages line in here, it will mean that every time I run this whole script, I will try to install the package again and again and again, even though we already have it. So this is why I sometimes just write it in here, okay, but then I just delete it. Um, because installing the package is not needed again and again and again if I execute the code. You only need to do it once and then you have it and then you can load it. For example, the Palmer Penguins package we can load here. Where can you load the Tidyverse package? Hi right there, it's Yanni from the future jumping in right from the edit. Uh, one thing I forgot to say during the lecture, now is probably a good time to take a break, make yourself a new cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and then come back here and jump into this next section. There's a um, bit of a switch up going to happen because I will um, soon switch to the project which is actually also generating the website. Before we do that, let's see what we got by installing this R Markdown package. What we can now do is add a new R Markdown doc a document, an R Markdown. Uh, so just up here, new file, R Markdown. And you can choose an output format. I will talk about those in a second and a title. Let's leave it at the defaults for now. And now it gets a bit more complicated, I apologize, than just those simple scripts. So our markdown documents consists of three parts. The first part is what we call the front matter. And this is some metadata about the document. So a document has a title, it has an author, for example, it has a date. We can change those and here is just text. And it has an output format. We'll talk about those in a second. And the next part, uh, let's skip this for now. The next part is um, just text, markdown text. The idea of markdown is um, you're writing just some text and then you can use these special symbols to say, for example, this click, uh, this knit, this will be in a bold font later on. And you can use, for example, underscores to make something italics, or you can make something a link using this syntax. And you can use these, and this is a bit confusing in our scripts, um, the hashtag symbol is used for comments. In our markdown, the hashtag symbol is used for headings. So this is a level two heading. We can also make a level one heading. And let's save it here. It automatically adds the .rmd file extension. And it already tells us that if we click the knit button, something happens. So let's do that. Now this is already quite magical because what happens here is we have this text and this will be formatted. Right? Level, level one heading, it will actually turn into a heading. This one is a heading as well. This here will turn into link. The knit button thing will be bold. So all this text formatting happens. And then these things we didn't talk about yet, for example here, these are code chunks. And everything in these code chunks is like a tiny version of the script we have in here. So we are basically taking the idea of writing a recipe for data analysis, but instead of writing everything in one thing, we are putting more focus on the code, uh, on, on, the, on the text, and we have these little code chunks. So we, we take our recipe and split it up into different pieces so we can better explain what's happening there. And this also allows us to more easily e execute parts of our code. Say I want to only execute this part, I can go into this code chunk, press the little play button, it will run only this part. And there's some data set built in R about cars, it tells us a summary about those cars. We can still use the same shortcuts we learned for the script file. So control enter also executes a line Control shift enter executes the whole chunk, which in this case doesn't make a difference. Um, but now here, if I shape just control enter, it executes this line. 
but control shift enter executes both lines and we get both output. So cars is the data set about the speed and distance some, some car went. But the cars data set is not really important for this demonstration. And when we click this knit button or use the shortcut control shift K, which I usually do, um, what happens is we get all this text formatted and R runs the code and also shows up the output. And this is especially nice for showing what you did, um, showing your code and also your output. Because, well, the way you generate your output is also important. But more importantly, when you're analyzing data, your thoughts doing this analysis matter. But they also matter to interpret the plots. And sometimes it's also helpful for yourself if you come back later to an analysis and you have written down what you did there and why you did it, especially why you did it, it will be much easier to think about the output and maybe change something as well. And this whole R markdown thing is also what I'm using to generate the website where you will have the code and the lecture videos up online. Let me actually get it right now. I think I have it open somewhere. So this here is also based on our markdown. We have this text and this is the output. I'm choosing in this example not to show the code, but only the output. We'll talk about how this works later on. One of the reasons I'm also showing you our markdown is that we are using this for the exercises. And the idea behind it is I want to not only give you exercises and then look at some results, I also want to see how you got there so I can tell you what you can improve with your code, for example. But I also want to enable you to add some more questions you have about the lecture, for example. You can just type these questions in the text and you can create this document, this report, which, create, which not only includes your code, but also your thoughts you had, um, the questions you have. And if you get stuck, you can also explain where you got stuck and all that part. Um, now, I only showed you this HTML output before, but there's more. I could also say I want this to be a PDF, which um, I guess is nice when you're printing something. I don't like printing stuff, but if you do, um, now we get this lecture1.pdf. And well, it looks like you created this with LaTeX, for example, because well, it was created with LaTeX. Or if you uh, like using Microsoft Word, you can create a docx document. Um, or is it just doc? I haven't created one in a, in a while. I think it's Word document, maybe. Yeah, it's Word document. And this will create a docx document. I don't have Microsoft Word installed on here. Let's see if LibreOffice can open this. Ah, here we go. So now we have a Word document, which includes the text we wrote. It includes the code, but also the output, like our blocks, for example. So this is quite handy. So you're, you're generating a research report. You're working on, on a scientific publication, for example. There's another thing I want to show you. And if you're using the newest version of our studio, you have this. Uh, in the top right corner of this editor, there's a button which says switch to visual markdown editor. And this is quite handy if you're not too familiar with our markdown and the markdown syntax. It shows you the, the text already formatted. So, and you can use it like, for example, like you would Microsoft Word. If I want to make this italics, for example, it turns italics. If I switch out of the editor, this is the text generated. So it will still be just a plain text file, but you can use it like, for example, Microsoft Word. So we can uh, make this strike through, for example, or, or code. And you still get these code chunks you can execute. In here, you can choose, um, and the other one as well, there's the little cogwheel where you can say, um, for the output, um, I want to only show the output, not the code. And then it adds this um, argument, which says echo.false. So if I knit this, I actually let's, let's turn it into 
an HTML document again, because it's faster to just have HTML. So like a little web page. Um, now, it's not no, no longer showing the code, only the output. Um, though for your exercises, please still show your code, um, because um, otherwise I can't know what went wrong, for example, if you, if you get stuck. I need to see your code. All right, and let's head over to the project I'm using for the course website. <clears throat> and these are actually all the notes I'm using to record this. So we did all these things. We talked about our studio. We talked about functions. We talked about installing and sharing functions um, and so installing packages. We talked about literature programming. And I want to use this as an example of how to use the course website. Let's see if I have already. Yeah, so this is the result of one. This video, of course, is not, not the newest one. It will be updated once I have this finished. I'm recording right now. Um, in here, I have some these hexagonal stickers. These are the logos of the packages we're using. And I set these up to be links as well. So they usually link to the website of the package. And on there, you can always find some helpful information. For example, one of these is the R Markdown cheat sheet, which is quite nice. We can, you can download it. Um, but also on the bottom, there's also the resources page, which let's see, it's, I think it's not online yet. Um, when it's online, you will find, ah, here it is. You will find a bunch more resources to learn more. Um, speaking of learning more before we, before we, before we dive into say, the data set for today and the, the bigger picture for today, um, I want to tell you how to hand in the exercises. Um, and for this, let's move over to Discord. So you click the link if you are a, a biochemist and you join the Discord server. And on there, you have a couple of channels, the welcome channel, there's no information right now. But if you get stuck on the exercise, you can always type something in the help uh, channel. The idea behind this is that if some of your colleagues know the answer already, they can also help you and not only me. So we are doing this as a team. We're learning this together. And then in the top right, which I have currently cropped because I don't want to show your usernames, of course, um, you will find my name, Yannick, with a little crown next to it. You can right click it um, and then you can say send a message. And this is where you can send me your exercise solutions. And for exercise solutions, I would like to have the HTML output. So. In, this, uh, marked, in these uh, Markdown documents, you will create one uh, Markdown document for each, uh, each lecture, for each set of exercises in which you can write your code, your, also your questions, and make sure to also explain why you're doing things. And then you knit the uh, Markdown document and send me the resulting HTML. But if you get stuck with something, you can always ask in the help channel. So that was a short introduction to the uh, Markdown package. And now we talk about the other two packages which I asked you to install. And the first one is the Tidyverse, which is, which is actually not just a package, it's a whole collection of packages. And if you are on the course website and you click on any of these little stickers I put on there as well, like ggplot and Tidyverse, you will always find the website for the particular package. And on there, there's usually very helpful cheat sheets, for example with shortcuts of how to do things and quick uh, and nicely glanceable explanations. Now, the idea behind this tidyverse is <clears throat> that a lot of functions in R are very powerful, but sometimes not very consistent. So the idea is to have this collection of packages which work very well together, which have a very consistent interface. So it makes it a lot easier to learn other parts of the tidyverse if you already know parts of it. And this makes it a lot more predictable and a lot more fun to learn. And we will be using this tidyverse to explore our first, our first data set. And the first data set is the Palmer penguins data set. It's about three penguin species, Chinstrap, Gentoo, and Adelai, which are living in the Palmer archipelago. 
which is a terribly hard word to say. Uh, somewhere close to the Arctic Circle. And we can load this uh, package using library and then Palmer Penguins. I actually have this already typed in here um, because uh, I recorded this already, but it turns out I only recorded my face for the whole 30 minutes that I was expl uh, explaining the <laughs> dataset and ggplot to you. So now I'm doing it again, and this time you can, sh you can actually see my screen. Right. So you have this uh, data set. If you execute library Palma Penguins, not much happens. We can see it's executed, executed here. Um, but then we get this data set. So if I type penguins and execute it, RStudio shows us a preview of this thing called a data frame. Um, well, in base R it's called a data frame. In the tidyverse, they have a new name. It's called a tibble. So we have data frames and tibble, but they are basically the same thing. And a data frame is just a collection of columns. And each column you can think of as a vector. So these things we did earlier where, say, we have the numbers from 1 to 10. This is a vector or some text. It's also a vector. The first one is a numeric vector. The second one is a character vector. And once again here, we see th that the bill length is of type double, so it's a numeric vector. Double is just another name um, for these numeric values, which can have commas or floating points in, in English. And the island and the species, uh, in here they are factors, which for now we can think of as um, pretty similar to just text except it can only have a defined set of values. But we will talk about uh, more about factors uh, next week. So for now, just think of them as just some text data, <coughs> which is categorized. So we can look through the columns here. We can look through more things. One thing I also wanted to show you is the function view. If you execute this in RStudio, it will open up this table, just like an Excel table, for example. However, you can't change anything in here. You can just look at things. We can, you can order things. It's quite handy. You can get the same effect by just holding down Control and clicking the penguins. So this will always open up. And you can take this thing, um, pull it out here with this button, and put it to the side, for example, if you want to have it visible at some point. This is nice if you have particularly large data sets that you want to see more of. But usually this short preview here is enough because, well, it's, it's anyway really hard to gain insights just from looking at the raw numbers. And this is why we make plots. We make plots because our brain is very good at seeing patterns in those. And we are very bad at seeing patterns just in numbers. Another way to inspect this penguin's data frame is with the function str, which stands for structure. And it shows us basically the same thing, just flipped on its side. So it's easier if you have a lot of columns, for example, it's easier to see all of them using the str for structure function. If you want to learn more about any function, again, press the F1 key, it opens up the help page which is usually, as the name suggests, very helpful. All right, got our penguins here. And this is from my previous run through. Let's delete that. Uh, one note, uh, all these notes in here, I will later on replace with actual text of that is similar to what I said in the lecture. So you can read up on the lecture, lecture after the fact, if you forgot something. And now I want to talk about what is called the grammar of graphics. It's a way of translating data into visualizations. And the idea behind this grammar is that you don't have to learn, say, a different function for every different type of plot. You learn just a couple of building blocks. And from these, you can build up any plot, any figure imaginable. So this makes it very powerful, but also approachable to learn. I am not loading just the ggplot2 package, I'm loading the complete tidyverse, 
which is a collection of packages, so it loads the ggplot2 as well. And we are only using ggplot2 today, but next week and the week after we will be using more of the tidyverse, so I just start by loading it all instead of just one package. All right. And before we go ahead and build this plot ourselves, let's talk about what a plot needs and what we can already see. So in this example, for, uh, we have the flipper length on the x-axis, which is a property that penguins have. They have a bill length in millimeters on the y-axis. And the data is display displayed as points which have different shape depending on if the penguin was female or male. Or if we didn't know the sex, we are not displaying it. It's NA not assigned. And the species we use to color code. And then we have some things around it like a title, a subtitle, a caption. So let's start from our data and then build up this plot. I'm loading the tidy once again, um, but I have done it already, I believe. So the first thing we want to do is call the function ggplot, which is a bit confusing because it's part of the ggplot2 package, but the function is just called ggplot. And this is what we always start our plots with. And the first argument is the data. We could now say data is penguins, but we know the first argument of ggplot is always data and we, we will be using it a lot. So we just say ggplot penguins. Second argument is the mapping. And the mapping is how we are translating the columns of our data set into visual aspects of our plot or aesthetic properties of our plot. This is why it's called an aesthetic mapping. And we are creating an aesthetic mapping to use as the mapping argument with the function AES, which stands for aesthetic. You can also remember I always open up the help page if you want. So the first argument is x. We want to say what's on the x-axis. Oh, and before I do that, let me show you what happens if I just call the ggplot function. It opens up an empty plot. And then if I just supply a data set, it, it's again just an empty plot. And now it gets interesting. We start by supplying <coughs> some aesthetics. So I think on the x-axis I wanted the bill lengths in millimeters or oh, flipper lengths. I used flipper lengths. I used flipper lengths on the y uh, on the x-axis and I actually used the bill lengths on the x-axis. Let's be explicit here. Whoops. One note, uh, white space, so just empty empty space, not important in R. So R will just ignore it. But we want to use that to make our code readable. So don't just cram everything down into like one line, for example. Make sure um, you have some white space around operators like equal, for example. And after commata, just like in, in writing. And then there's some more conventions to follow, and you'll probably pick those up if you follow along my coding. Mm, all right, and now we execute this, and ggplot has already done something. Right? We have billings on the x-axis, and the scale of this matches the scale of our data. So I think it was the other way around in, in the example above, but this shouldn't matter. And now it's switched around. We can't see anything because we have just gotten some data and provided an aesthetic mapping. What we haven't done is provide a way of displaying the data with geometric objects. And these are called geoms. And they all start with geom underscore, which makes auto-completion a lot easier. Auto-completion happens automatically, or you trigger it with control space or with tab. 
and we are adding new things to our blot using the plus sign. And I usually put this on a new line after the plus sign because it makes the code more readable. So the geom we want is the geom point. And now we have all the points. And if you go ahead and add some more aesthetics to be mapped to properties of, uh, of the data, we can also say, for example, that the shape of our points should be mapped to the sex column of the penguins. And furthermore, let's actually make a new line here. And furthermore, the color of the points should be mapped to the species. Now remember, I'm using Control Shift Enter to execute the whole chunk. Yeah. Um, there's something that GBlot has already automatically added, and this is a coordinate system. Per default, it's just Cartesian coordinates. But just to show you that there are more uh, more options, we could also do the whole thing in polar, so circular coordinates, um, which makes no sense in this example. But just to show you that different coordinates are possible. And we can use, we can explicitly add coord Cartesian, which is already the default, so it doesn't do anything. But we could use this to supply more arguments to the Cartesian coordinate system. For example, we can change the x limits, which takes a vector with two values, one for the lower and one for the upper um, limit. Say we only want to share data from 190 to 200. This is how we could do it. Want to, know more, want to know more about the function, open the help page with F1. And then read about the arguments here. Right, but we don't want to change, change this here. The default one is fine. About guides, guides are automatically added, like legends, for example, here. And so we don't want to change anything about this for now. But we could say, um, for the color, we want the guide none, which is just no, no guide. There's a shortcut for this, just none. But usually the elements you add here are guide underscore, and then you can customize it. For example, we could make it a, a color bar, which I think makes no sense in here. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work because discrete values. So guide legend is the normal thing to have here. And there we could specify things like the title, the labels, different things. All right. But the default one is just fine. We're sticking with that. What we do want to add is uh, change the colors a bit. Say we don't like the default colors. And this is done using scales. So a scale determines how exactly the values of the data are mapped to this aesthetic property. For numbers on the x-axis, for example, it's fairly straightforward. Um, so scale, for example, say you want to scale the x-axis, and these are continuous values. So they can be any value in between. These are not um, discrete. Like the species, for example, is discrete. It can only, only be three species, but the flipper length, just a number. Um, this is why we need to scale continuous. And the things you can change here, for example, is the name of the scale or the name of the axis. We can say where the breaks are, um, which is, in this case, the 170, 180, 110, for example. Or we can say how many breaks we want in, in total. Say we only want uh, three breaks or 10. Or 100, which is way too much. Or we can say where the breaks should be, and this, which is for this, we supply a vector of numbers. Say 170, we want the 191, and we want the 220. 
And now we only get these breaks. We can also apply a transformation to this. And this is a calculation that is done to the numbers. For example, there's a number of options. For example, at some point we will talk about logarithmic scales, and this is one way to do it. But for now, the default scales are fine, so let's just remove this. What I do want to change is the scale of the num the color. So for this, we use scale color. And there's a, diff a number of already defined color scales, which we could use. For example, there is C for, uh, or D, because it's discrete. C is continuous, B is binned, but D is discrete. We could use this one. Uh, what I used in the example of above is from the color brewer package, but per default, it is a different type. It assumes these colors are sequential in value, so they get more and more blue as they go, but we want to have this qualitative, which is what the uh, qual type does. Another way we could have gone about this is to do this manually. Scale color manual. And then we say the values um, are, say, red. Red, green, and... Oh, that's really very bad for colorblind people. So let's uh, do red, blue, and green. Wait, now it's still it's still at red and green. Let's do red, blue, and orange. Maybe that's better. And then the overall way this plot looks like is determined by the theme. We can use the theme function to change a lot of things. For example, uh, let's first give it a title using the labs function for labels. And there you can see a bunch of things you can label. You can also label the axis with this function. Oh, I forgot the plus in here. And then we can say what the title should look like. Let's open the help page for theme in here. So all these things, these are all the options, they are a lot. And the title argument, it takes something that is produced by element underscore text. So this is just a way to make it easier for us to find out what the options are that we have. So all these theme, the parts of the plot that this theme changes are produced by the elements. So an element underscore now the type of element of title is, is text, it's just text. And this allows us to create the type of title that we want. Say for example, we want to change the color to be, uh, to be purple. And this just changes all elements which are titles. So not just the plot title, but also the x, x axis and y axis title and the legend title. We could be more specific by saying uh, plot.title. And now only the complete plot title is changed. And if you don't want to be so fine-grained and instead apply like an overall theme, there's a couple of built-in ones. Theme underscore black and white, for example, classic, dark. Classic, I probably... You probably want to use if you look want to look a bit old school but professional. The minimal is something I quite like. And then while we're at it, um, there's also the function theme underscore set. The theme set takes a theme and it just applies it whenever you call a plot afterwards. So if I type theme minimal in here. I can remove this here 
and all the plots that come after this was done. So I will put this at the top of my script, right underneath my library call. So I load my packages, I set my theme, and then I do the rest. And this will then apply to all the plots that follow, which is one way to do it. And if you then want to change an, an individual plot, you can still add a theme to it. Mm. Now, how do we save a plot? Let's go in here. And what we want to do is assign this plot to a variable. Let's call it my plot. If I run this now, you notice we don't get any output. We don't see the plot anymore. And this is because we're just storing it in here. But once we have stored it, we can do with it whatever you want. One thing we can do is we just call it and look into it and uh, displace the plot to us. But we can also use it and pass it to other functions. And one of those functions, oh, and not only other functions, now we can still treat it like a plot and add other plot elements to it. Um, just a side note. So if I now wanted to say, uh, change the label of the y-axis, this would now take this plot and change the label of the y-axis and then display it. And I could then save it again to a new plot, which would give me a new plot, where it's a slightly different version of the other plot, just in case you, you, you ever need that. It's sometimes nice to have to, to build like a base plot, a very basic plot or something, and then add things to it later on. So what we want to do this with this is save it. And for this, we need the function ggsave. We first give it a file name. Let's make it a PNG plot. So it automatically determines what type of graphics device it needs for PNGs. Um, and then we give it the plot, which is my plot. And if I run this and have a look in my files, this is the RStudio project folder. That should be, yeah, there's my plot in here. And which, which looks very bad in here because I have set it up to render transparent backgrounds a bit differently. It looks better on white background, I assume. All right. And last but not least, uh, let's talk about this whole idea of the exercise and all that. Um, coding can be quite intimidating at first because you are talking to this computer and sometimes the computer un doesn't understand you. And sometimes the only thing you can do is try and Googling the error message. Um, but you are not alone in this. So we have this Discord channel. If you run into issues, just uh, send a message in the help channel or message me in a direct message if you are too embarrassed. Um, but if you're too embarrassed about asking questions, maybe don't be, it's fine. Everybody's learning. Um, and then as a little bonus thing, I wanted to talk about this RStudio themes thing, which I said we need to talk about later because I first need to introduce packages. And this is the package, which, well, packages can not only give you data sets and new functions, they can also give you RStudio themes. And one of these is the RS themes package, which allows the catch. <clears throat> Normally, you would install packages with install packages, and then here are RS themes. In this case, it will not work. You get an error message and it says um, not available. The reason for this is there's multiple ways of storing packages. So the official way of where we got our packages from is from CRAN. And CRAN stands for the Comprehensive R Archive Network. This is also where we downloaded R itself, the programming language. And this is where you got all the sort of official packages where people handed those in. They are tested a bit more thoroughly. So install packages installs packages from CRAN. If you want to install packages from someone else's um, source code from somewhere else, for example, people often put things up on GitHub, which is also where you can always find the source code for the Tidyverse packages, for example. You can Google the package name and GitHub, and you will find one of these pages, which usually, usually has a nice website according, uh, accordingly. And now it tells you how to install it from GitHub. For this, we need an additional package called DevTools. So I run this here, 
and I ran this earlier, so I have it already installed. And then we can use DevTools install package and install the RS themes package. A quick note about this syntax with the double colon. That's a way to, instead of loading the complete package using library DevTools in this example, and then getting all the functions, to just say, I want just one function from this package. So if you don't, don't need the whole package and all the functions, you only want to execute one function from a package, you use the package name and then double colon, um, and then the function. And the auto completion will also help you here. So DevTools, um, if I have it installed, DevTools, install GitHub. Um, and then you can use the function rsthemes, install themes. If you execute this, you will see more themes um, coming up here. And I like to use this Nord theme just so you're hopefully not confused because everything looks a bit different on my computer than it does on yours. All right. I will put up the exercises um, on the website. They will be down at the bottom of the script. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out and I'll see you in the seminar.